you're looking at a ghost. Statistically, I should have been dead five years ago. I was diagnosed with breast cancer nine years ago, with liver metastases seven years ago. Why aren't I dead yet? Because of good luck, good oncologist, good surgeons, good drugs. Maybe because I'm a physician, I make better treatment decisions. Maybe because I'm young, I'm more aggressive, and I think outside the box. Because I'm a doctor, here's how I got my diagnosis. The surgeon calls on a Friday evening at 6 p.m. Never a good sign. He says, "You have invasive ductal carcinoma." I said, "In situ?" He says, "No." I said, "But that's cancer." He says, "Yes." I said, "Are you sure they got the right sample? Maybe my name was put on the wrong slides." He says, "No. You have invasive ductal carcinoma." Not in situ. I cried for the next two hours on a plane. My friend picked me up at the airport and said, "What's wrong? What did he do?" Assuming I was crying over boy problems. I said it for the first time. I have cancer. Due to chemo and surgery, my work in the petri dish of preschoolers became hazardous. Having never taken more than a few weeks off at a time, with trepidation, I took six months off. Aside from the chemo and the surgeries, it was a nice vacation. I dodged radiation that time, saving it in my back pocket for later use. My first recurrence was about one year after initial diagnosis. My oncologist ordered a PET CT scan as a one-year follow-up. I don't think other oncologists would have ordered that scan. I staged myself about 3C at diagnosis. I had four tumors ranging from two to five centimeters and palpable axillary nodes. I think that PET scan saved my life. Oblivious, though, I went right after the scan. I went rock climbing in Thailand for three weeks. When I returned, there were messages of increasing alarm from my oncologist. First was. I have your PET scan results. Please call me. Then, please call me. I'm concerned about your scan results. Finally, there's a spot on your liver on your PET scan. We need to talk. Talk about a buzzkill after a great vacation. I went for a liver biopsy, and there it was: breast cancer metastatic to my liver. Though statistics say not to do surgery on metastatic disease, my surgeon strongly recommended resection. Because this was a single tumor in an easy location, my liver surgeon said it would be like taking a chip shot off the corner of my liver. He did it laparoscopically. It was crazy waking up in the ICU post-op, thankfully extubated. I chatted a lot with my ICU nurse. I think I was his only conscious patient. We went to the same high school. I stayed five days at the hospital and recovered pretty much in a month. Not so bad. Oh, and by the way, they let me know after surgery that they removed my gallbladder. It was laying on the tumor, although the tumor hadn't escaped the liver capsule. I asked if they took out any other organs while they were in there. Do I still have an appendix? The worst thing about cancer is the treatment. I have never had a symptom from my cancer. All of my pain and suffering have come from chemo. Surgery and radiation. It's hard to accept as an outwardly healthy, fit person that I have to take this chemo or lay down for that surgery. I like to see my PET scans, see what lights up, see my biopsy results. I know as a physician that doctors aren't perfect; we make mistakes. Thankfully, I haven't had any mistakes, major mistakes, in my course of treatment. But I have many friends who have had wrong scan readings. For example, telling them that they're disease-free, overlooking bone metastases, or a friend who had a large tumor removed from her spine, which they forgot to send to pathology. They just threw it out. She has to live without knowing her pathology, without being able to send her tumor for Keras or Foundation One or any of the other cool tumor tests you guys are developing. 
My second recurrence was a little local chest wall spot, a nest of tumor cells, said the pathologist. My surgeon cut it off. The radiologist radiated the local area. Glad I saved radiation for a rainy day. Early in my cancer journey, as they say, I joined a local support group called Bay Area Young Survivors, BAYS, for young women with breast cancer diagnosed under age 45. I was 32. BAYS has a subgroup for women with metastatic disease called METS in the City. About 5% of breast cancer is diagnosed under age 40, and 30% of us develop metastatic disease. 16% of breast cancer deaths occur under age 50. With liver metastasis, the prognosis is one to two years. But I am an individual, not a statistic. Although we should all be data points. The women of Bayes and Mets in the City have taught me immeasurably. We share our frustrations, anger, fears, side effects, the most intimate details. We also share our deaths. Since I joined the group seven years ago, over 20 women have died. They're not just a number, they're my friends. Courtney, Elizabeth, Tara, Chi, Melissa, Erin, Julia, Felicia, Sam. As I walked with them, so others will walk with me, this path of progressing disease, more horrifying treatments, and inevitable death. We help each other to live while we die. The third recurrence was also in my liver, in a different spot from before, but still a solitary tumor. My liver surgeon said he could remove it, but the location was tricky at the confluence of the hepatic veins, arteries, and the bile duct. He said it was where my soul would be, if you believe in a physical location for your soul. So he's going to remove my soul? When I woke up in the ICU, I saw the same nurse from two years before. I said groggily, I remember you, we went to the same high school. <laughs> that surgery worked. I got four years afterwards with no evidence of disease, NED, as they say. Apparently, when you're metastatic, you can't have remission or be cured. Your disease is just hiding out, waiting to resurrect itself. During that four years, I still had maintenance treatments every two to four weeks, Herceptin, Fazlodex, and Lupron. Have any of you ever had a Fazlodex injection? Holy shit. They use an 18-gauge needle, which is so big they have to jab it in like a javelin, and push the thick, viscous liquid into your gluteus maximus. It takes a full minute to push in. The first time, I nearly fainted. Eventually, I got used to it, and I was able to have two injections at one visit, which is the full dose. That Fazlodex kept me NED for four years. Eventually, my tumor markers started drifting up. Most oncologists don't use tumor markers because they're very nonspecific. Mine had never been abnormal, so when the markers started rising, my onc and I were concerned. I had an MRI of my liver, clean. The marker kept going up. I had a PET scan, clean. I asked my oncologist if we could stop checking tumor markers, because they're making us crazy. He said, Something is brewing, we just can't see it yet. He was right. In a few months, my tumor markers doubled. I had another MRI of my liver. Aha, there they are, the sneaky bastards. Pathology read, at least 15 tumors scattered all over the liver, mostly about one centimeter, with a larger five centimeter tumor at the confluence of the hepatic vessels. There it is in my soul again. One truth about metastatic cancer is that you will always and forever be in treatment. You ride one drug as long as it works, and when the cancer progresses, you try another treatment. Targeted treatments specific to your tumor or its location have less systemic side effects. They hurt less. 
Early in 2015, three new targeted drugs that could work on my specific tumor were FDA approved. I'm on the third drug now. It's slowing tumor growth, but starting to fail as the others did. Meanwhile, my onc suggested another targeted approach that was discussed earlier called transarterial radioembolization. They inject radioactive microbeads into the hepatic artery. The beads follow the arteries to their capillary ends and lodge there. Because tumors are greedy for nutrients, they're very vascular. So these radioactive beads will preferentially cluster around the tumors, though they do affect normal liver too. The radioactive beads both obstruct the blood flow and nuke the surrounding tissue. The interventional radiologist does only half a liver at a time due to the risk of full hepatic failure. I qualify because I only have liver mets, nowhere else, and I'm not in liver failure yet. You can also do chemoembolization, the same thing with beads impregnated with chemo. It's supposed to be an easy recovery, one to two weeks, and then you go back for the other half of your liver. For unknown reasons, my recovery was hell. I have never experienced so much pain, even after two prior liver surgeries. I was in agony for a month. I couldn't possibly do the other side. I'm in a position of having to decide between quality and quantity of life. That radioembolization diminished my quality of life to zero for a month. But it worked. My tumor markers went down to nearly normal before starting to rise again. Now that the pain memory is six months old, I'm considering doing the other side next month. I'm also looking into what's next. I've been trying some immune-boosting therapy using bisphosphonates and IL-2, but it's off-label, and I'm not seeing results yet. I'm looking into what clinical trials I may qualify for. As I approach trying chemo again, I, think, I shudder thinking about the side effects. Why don't cancer patients want to lose their hair? It's not just vanity, it's privacy. A bald woman screams, I'm on chemo. But really, hair loss isn't so bad. My least favorite side effect is nausea and vomiting. Then there's also heart failure, your jawbone could disintegrate, and you could get a new cancer from your cancer treatment. Plus, there's chronic diarrhea, constipation, mouth sores, heartburn, skin cracking and dry and won't heal, shingles, folliculitis, neuropathy, tingly fingers and toes, general fatigue, grumpiness, low patience for anyone and anything. You feel achy like you're coming down with something, but you aren't. It's just chemo. I hope for a future where systemic chemotherapy is a barbaric thing of the past, where nobody has to go through chemo side effects. Yes, I eat my fruits and veggies. I take lots of supplements specific to my illness. I drink lots of green tea. I don't drink alcohol anymore. I take probiotics, chia seeds, flax seeds. I get into nature, I exercise a lot, and I have a positive attitude. But you can't eat, pray, meditate, or yoga away death. Juicing and supplements, ozone and supercooling, these aren't going to prevent death. Life is terminal. What we can do is live well while we're dying. Accepting that death is coming, maybe sooner for me than others my age, isn't being pessimistic, it's real. I stopped working with my fourth recurrence. I'm doing things people do in retirement, traveling the Silk Road, hiking the John Muir Trail, climbing Mount Shasta. People keep asking me if I'm going back to work. No, I'm on my last recurrence. This one isn't going into remission or NED. I will die of liver failure, when my treatments can't push back the tumor growth. Maybe I know this because I'm a physician or because I'm a realist. I'm not going to sugarcoat it to make other people feel better. 
about 30% of Medi-Cal dollars are spent in the last year of life. A study in the Annals of Internal Medicine showed that the more money spent at the end of life, the worse the dying process was. Conversely, the less money spent at the end of life, the better quality of death. I postulate that if we were more accepting that we will all die, we would significantly decrease our end-of-life spending, and we would also be less miserable at the end. Death is considered a failure in Western culture and medicine. As physicians, we are taught that if someone dies, it's because something went wrong. That's not true. Everybody dies. People who sign up for hospice live one to two months longer. But people think hospice is giving up, stopping the fight, losing hope. Not true. It's accepting that we are all mortal, and my time is coming. We need to talk about death and dying with our loved ones. As doctors, we need to talk about dying with our patients, not only when the end is close, but at every age and stage of life. For example, when you have a baby, you need to think about what happens if you die. Maybe you enjoy heli skiing, and the helicopter goes down, or an avalanche takes you out. Everyone needs an advance directive, a will, a trust. You may be thinking, how could she be dying? She looks great. Look at her energy. Yes, I am living well with my terminal diagnosis. I'm not laying down, rolling over, and giving up on life. As I said, I am not a statistic. You're not a statistic either. And you, you're definitely not a statistic. We're all going to beat the odds, right? Maybe, for a little while. But even if you're still jogging at 100, or jogging at 200, you're still going to die. If you knew when you were going to die, if you knew exactly how much time you had left, how would you live? What would you do the same or differently? I'll leave you with a little poem I wrote. In a hurry. I want to see, touch, do, taste, smell, feel, everything. I want to go everywhere, walk the earth, climb the mountains and snowboard down. Try everything, at least once. Lots to do, I'm in a hurry. Not much time left. How long do I have before the cancer makes it impossible? Narrows the world to just my room, my doctor's office, the hospital. I don't know. I can't know. Time wasted, planning for a future I don't have. Working to save for a family I will never have. No more. I'm here now to experience everything to dance and laugh and sing around the world and at home. But I can't do it all. No lifetime is enough to experience everything, to watch the sunrise from space. I will see, do, taste, smell, feel everything I can in my lifetime, however long or short it may be. And it will be enough.